All right, well, now we come to the place in our service where we remember Christ for who he is and the work that he performed in the place of all believers at the cross. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to be taking a small wafer and a bit of juice, and these are symbols of the body and the blood of Christ. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a passage where Jesus is it's clear that his nature as the son of God is essential to his role as the redeemer. So if you have your Bible with you, would you turn with me to Galatians 4? We're going to be looking at verses 4 and 5 together. There should be some men coming down the aisles. If you don't have a Bible, just raise their hand and they will get one to you. And if you don't own a Bible, please consider this as our gift to you so that you can begin reading God's word for yourself. Paul closes the end of chapter three and he begins chapter four with an analogy. And the analogy is that of an heir. And we all know what an heir is. An heir is one who one day will take possession of something valuable. Uh, but before that day, and we see this in verses one and two, the heir is no different from those who don't have an inheritance. He's exactly the same as them. He's of the same nature. He's governed by the same principle. He looks just like those who have no inheritance. But in verse three, Paul turns the corner and he draws a connection between the analogy of the air and the spiritual condition of those who don't believe. He says, so also we, while we were children, we were enslaved under the elemental things of the world. The one who has no belief spiritually is a slave. And what they're a slave to is their own self-rule. They have turned from God and they've run after everything that their own soul desires. But God is a reconciling God. And we see that in verse four, God is the one who reconciles. He is a relational God who desires to reconcile sinners to himself. So as we read our passage, verses four and five, look for a couple of things. Uh, look in verse four at what verse four says about the person of Christ. And then look in verse five at verse, what that verse says about the purpose of Christ. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, so that he might redeem those who were under law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So looking back at verse four, God sent forth his son. That tells us something about the person of Christ, the eternally existent second person of the Godhead. This is so important when we consider God's design to reconcile people to himself. Christ himself had the resources as the second person of the Godhead to purchase the salvation of those for whom he was dying. But we also see that Christ was born of a woman. He entered the same, the world in the same way that the rest of us did through a woman. He was one of us. And that's so important because, because he was one of us, he could stand as our representative in God's system of justice. So here we have this one who is the son of God on one hand and has every resource necessary to do the task in front of him. And on the other hand, he can represent those for whom he's dying. But the end of the verse tells us something else that's very, very important that we need to consider about Christ today as we remember him this morning. We see that it says that he was born under law. The reason why Christ was born under law was so that he could satisfy law. He could meet every condition of God's justice, every term of God's justice. This is so important because dating back to the Old Testament, God's system of justice demanded that an innocent sacrifice take the place of the guilty and the guilty would go free. So Christ himself had to be born under law and he had to keep every term of God's law. And he did. So we have Christ. He's fully God. He's fully man. And at the same time, he's fully innocent. He's fulfilling every term of God's law and he is ready and prepared for one purpose. And that purpose is there in verse five. It's so encouraging to the believer that he might redeem those who are under the law. Now to redeem is to purchase somebody. It's to purchase a person away from the power of another by the payment of a price. That is exactly what Christ did. And this is not just an accounting term. There is real work involved here, real work on the part of Christ 
Work was demanded of him as he hung on the cross. And that work was to satisfy the wrath of the father against every single offense that was committed by every single person that would put their trust in Christ. That was a massive work that Christ performed on that cross that day outside of Jerusalem. And it had one major benefit. And we see that in verse five, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Adoption is part of God's design. It's an essential part of God's design. Adoption is the process by which a child permanently becomes a part of a family to which they don't naturally belong. Every one of us who is born of God has been born into his family. We are adopted into his family. We were not born in his family. This is what separates biblical Christianity from every other belief system in the world is that God rescues sinners and brings them into his family. And that is what he does. So that's the benefit. So this is God's reconciling character. He takes his only son, has him take on the form of human flesh and meet every condition of his law so that God could use him as a sacrifice in his system of justice to die for those who would put their trust in him. If we keep reading, we see that God doesn't leave us wondering who these people are that Christ died for. Look at verse six. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our house, crying, Abba, Father. The one who has been redeemed by Christ is the one who considers and acts and lives with God as their father. And there are two pieces to that. There's a relational intimacy of a child and a father, a nearness and a closeness. So there's an understanding. There's a familial bond. So that's the first piece of it. But the second piece is equally important. And that is the one who cries out, Abba, Father, lives under the authority of that father. As it's given to us in the headship and the lordship of Jesus Christ. So this is you this morning. If Christ is your Lord, if he is your master, please join us in taking the elements. When they come to you, just take them and hold them and consider for a minute the person of Jesus Christ and what he did in your place at the cross. Consider his perfect life. Consider his absolute deity. And consider his humanity, that all of those things work together at the cross to save you from the end that you deserve. And when your heart is prepared, take the elements on your own. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, we want to tell you that we are very, very thankful that you're here with us this morning. It truly is our joy that you're here with us. There could be no greater joy for us than to proclaim the good news of the gospel to you. Uh, This, again, is a time for Christians. It's a time for people who know Christ and submit to his lordship in their life So when the elements come to you, just pass them to the person next to you. But take this time to consider that God has one method of reconciling people to himself, and that is through the person of Christ. At the end of our service, there will be somebody standing up here to my right. They would love to talk with you, answer any questions you might have. They will have a Bible. They can open their Bible. They can pray with you about the good news of the gospel. But when the elements come to you, just pass them to the next person. Men, come in service, and I'll come back in a moment.